free. You said a minute? Wait. No, no, that's all right. Just whenever you, he'll put it on the front end, I think. It's 30 seconds is good enough and it'll roll in. Bobby, Bobby's editing, so editing the front end and back end only. <coughs> Hello and welcome to In Our Community. We're visiting today with Francis Ha and Janae Aubrey of Project Sentinel. And I want to thank you both for being here. This is a very important topic for our viewers. Um, Francis, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, my name is Francis Ha. I am the Senior Fair Housing Coordinator at Project Sentinel. I serve Santa Clara County, um, including the cities of Mountain View, Palo Alto, and Santa Clara City. Very nice. And Aubrey, please. Hi, I'm Janae Aubrey. I'm the Fair Housing Staff Attorney for the cities of uh, Milpitas, Sunnyvale, and Fremont. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, well, let's get right to it, shall we? Um, can you tell us a little bit about Project Sentinel? What what is this Project Sentinel? Yes, Project Sentinel is a nonprofit housing agency. Uh, Project Sentinel has been around since 1976, and we focus on three main um, services related to housing. One is on uh, mortgage counseling, the and home buyer education. The other is landlord tenant. Uh, we have a mediation dispute resolution program in landlord tenant and housing discrimination. And Janae and I both work in the fair housing or housing discrimination department. Okay, and so then the follow-up question, of course, would be what is housing discrimination? So housing discrimination is a situation where someone has been denied housing and it's based on a characteristic a person has that doesn't have anything to do with their ability to be a good tenant. So it can be based on, on race, religion, national origin, uh, familial status or families of young children, uh, disability, and sex. Uh, in addition, the state of California has expanded those categories to include sexual orientation, gender identity, immigration status, and first language. Okay, very good. Uh, Janae, can you tell us more about the Fair Housing Act to give us some little bit of history about it maybe and what is it, how does it work to help the person renting? So I can give you a little context. So the Fair Housing Act does provide some protections for um, specific protected categories. So Francis mentioned a few just now. So it's a federal law that protects, um, for example, based on race or, or disability, um, marital status, uh, national origin. Um, help me out if I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> so the, the other categories. Yeah, so the, the other categories that I have just mentioned, like familial status, disability, religion, um, and some of the other categories that Janae has mentioned. And so basically, if someone believes or suspects that they have been discriminated and they fall within those uh, protected categories, um, the person can uh, take enforcement action and go through the government so, uh, and file a, an administrative complaint, uh, which may include uh, filing a complaint with the Department of Housing and Urban Development or under the state of California, file a complaint with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. And would you folks help that person with that complaint? Is that part of what you do or not? Certainly. Can they call you? Yes. And have you walked them through it? Yes, certainly. If so, if someone believes that they have been discriminated, uh, they can contact us. Our phone number is 408-720-9888. I will repeat that again. It's went oh, a little sorry. slower. Sorry. Please. So I will repeat that again, and I'll say it slowly. The phone number is 408-720-9888. Eight. Beautiful. Okay, thank you so much. And tell us, I'm curious, you may not know this historic stuff, how did the United States go about getting a Fair Housing Act? Was there some big 
moment of major discrimination? Did something big happen in American history that caused Congress to pass such a law? Yes, so during the 1960s, uh, there was a series of laws passed, uh, starting with the Civil Rights Act, um, and, the, and it led to the Voting Rights Act, and in 1968, it led to the culmination of the Fair Housing Act. And that basically granted, as I said, legal protections for people that have been denied housing uh, based on the categories which we had spoken before. Okay, and Janine, do you have anything you want to add? I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> I feel like I'm leaving you out. No, there's nothing. I think she covered it pretty well. Okay. All right, so then um, we have this Fair Housing Act, and I'm, I'm a senior, so I don't remember now quite that was the Johnson administration, 68, when it came to be? Yes, during the Johnson administration, that was when the Fair Housing Act was passed and implemented. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna ask the question first, I'm gonna say a sentence and then pose the question. Regarding types of housing, was there a time when the Fair Housing Act covered certain types of housing and then later it expanded? or perhaps later it contracted, or has it been about the same since it came about? So I, I, I'm i not aware about what types of housing has been expanded or, or, or contracted. I will say with the initial act that was passed in 1968, uh, my understanding is that disabilities was not included. And that, and my understanding is families of children was not included as a federally protected category. Those categories were added later. Okay, now please take each one of those two and tell us a little bit more. The first one of the two was? Disabilities. Disabilities, okay. Now being a disabled person, I'm very interested in knowing about that. And Janae, Chime in when you want to. I don't want you to feel like you're not getting a chance to say something. My audience is going to wonder, why is she not talking? Why is she not talking? Uh, so tell us a little bit, perhaps, about the discrimination component. What, how did that come about? Because I'm a disabled person. So if they were, if they expanded it to include disabled people, is that what you said? Yes. Uh, tell us how that happened. How, how, when did that happen? I think I'm definitely going to let you... Okay, so <laughs> I, okay, so we'll I'll, I'll mention. Because I, I really I really want to know, and I think my audience wants to know. Okay, so my under I want to I want to say it was 1988, but let, let I, I I'd say approximately right around that time. But I I will say probably one thing that Janae could probably talk about is a common type of discrimination that affects disabled people, and that is the denial of reasonable accommodations. So if you want to, could you say something about that? Give us a definition of. A reasonable accommodation? Reasonable accommodation. So yeah, I can definitely then. do that. So a reasonable accommodation, it's a request to make an exception to a housing provider's policy or a rule. So a common example is a no pet policy. So we often ask for a reasonable accommodation to have an emotional support animal or a service animal. And um, we often step in when a housing provider has denied that request. And there's only um, a select um, few um, reasons why a housing provider can deny a reasonable accommodation request, and that can be an undue financial burden or administrative cost, or if the, I guess the request isn't reasonable, if it asks the housing provider to do something more than provide housing, such as maybe transportation, for example. Okay. Um, and at this point, would one of you, Janae, would you, if you can, very slowly repeat mm -hmm. the phone number for us, please? For one, of, one <laughs> of you, please repeat the phone number slowly. Sure. So the phone number is 408-720-9888. That helps because after the first time, people probably went, oh, I don't have a pen and paper. Right. And then they're going to go do that. And what's your website? So the website is www.housing.org. Really? Yeah. How <laughs> nice for you. you yes. Can sell that and get a bunch of funding for the group probably, yes. right? <laughs> yes. That's like, that's quite a number. Okay, so let's see, we talked, did we talk about liability? That was liability? 
Not, we haven't we spoken haven't talked about, about liability. liability yet. Can you start us out and see where we get to? Is there li who is liable under the fair housing laws? Yes. So, uh, people that are liable under the fair housing laws is under the uh, scope of housing providers, and that may include landlords, property managers, maintenance, property management staff. Um, I mean, even like the janitor. Security, a security guard on the property. Yes. Yes. Anyone who's under the purview of the owner of the property. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, give me an example. Give me an example of someone who's not obviously the owner. Like, I come home. I don't want to make up the example myself. I'd rather you did. But give me an example. I come home to an apartment I'm renting and... And you want an example of someone who would be held liable or held yes, responsible? Yes, some, something went wrong such that one of the people under the umbrella of the owner was held liable other than the owner. Certainly. So, and actually maybe you could talk about because you had a case where... So we, need to, we need to be able to visualize what you're talking about. The harassment case? Yeah. yeah, so there are examples where maybe a maintenance worker, for example. I've had a case where a maintenance worker sexually harassed a tenant. So that maintenance worker is still um, is held responsible. The housing provider is held responsible for that maintenance worker's um, harassment of a tenant. That's that's good to know because it it's not always obvious to a senior who really it's more likely we'll say oh just let it go it's too much trouble. But you're helping us stand up for our rights, and it's not just seniors obviously, but I, our our show has a lot of senior viewers so. Uh, where are your areas of service? What do you cover? Only Santa Clara County, what areas do you cover? Uh, so uh, our services, in addition to Santa Clara County, include San Mateo County, uh, Sacramento County, in Alameda County we serve the city of Fremont, um, and Stanislaus County. Okay, now I'm a person who lives in San Leandro at the moment. Mm -hmm. If I were to call you, and say, I'm in a bind and I live in San Leandro, could you refer me to another agency? Yes, so San Leandro is in Alameda County, okay. is that correct? Yes, so, it is. So you would, I would refer you to contact ECHO. ECHO is the main fair housing agency in the East Bay or Alameda County. And would you make a call for me or would you just say, make the call, here's the number? I would give you the name and I would give you the phone number to contact. Okay, Echo. very nice, very nice, thank you. This is important because it's difficult for a senior to take such a step, mm -hmm. especially if they found housing that they like, mm -hmm. that's at the price they can afford, mm -hmm. and then something happens, it's much more uh, obvious to them that, well, maybe I'll just let it go by, mm -hmm because how am I going to find a place, moving is difficult. Mm -hmm. So you can see how we need to make this easy enough right. and important enough that they'll right. actually do something. Right. Who, by, which brings me to a question, what do you think the profile is of your demographic or give me a rough, a rough breakdown of your demographic in any, in any way that you want. It could be by age or by ethnicity or any way that you normally measure it? I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, we, we serve a wide group, a diverse group of people because of the makeup of the, the protected classes. I mean, we, we serve immigrants, we serve seniors, we serve the, uh, we serve the, the disabled. Um, I mean, we, we serve everyone regardless of socioeconomic uh, level and we serve everyone regardless of immigration status. Very nice. I was hoping you'd say that part. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so then I have a question. What are some common fair housing complaints that you see? What are some of the most common complaints that you see? Okay, so uh, I'll mention one, and if Janae doesn't mind, yeah. she can uh, yes, address another. So uh, familial status or families of young children, uh, we've been getting a lot of complaints uh, in that area at Project Sentinel. Um, a lot of 
families of young children are being denied housing or they're being harassed. And how um, does it how does it show up? The landlord when they try to rent will say, "Oh, it's already filled" or something of that nature. How does the person who's trying to rent come to sense that I'm being discriminated against? Certainly, uh, in situations where someone is looking for housing, uh, we've had situations where when someone disclosed that they had young kids. They would make co like discouraging comments saying, oh, does your child draw everywhere? Uh, we had one person who was pregnant. When she disclosed she was pregnant, she says, how big is your stomach? Um, Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm serious. Okay, or, they, so. or they have a really strict occupancy policy saying, oh, we're only looking for two people max for a two bedroom. Those and are so, so if people say things like that, the person who was being interviewed for the housing could consider calling you guys. Correct, correct. Because we want to, we want them to know what just happened in there. Yes. You know, it's hard for the person to know. Yes. Janae, could you add something for us? Yeah, on that, of course. Please? So I know I spoke a little bit about reasonable accommodations before, but that is our most common, um, our most common complaint or request that we okay. get. Um, examples I already gave: so emotional support animal, service animal, or sometimes it can be asking for a closer parking spot or if someone's wheelchair bound or has trouble walking, they might ask for a unit transfer. So if they're on the second floor or an upper floor and they would like a transfer to the ground floor because they have trouble navigating stairs. That's pretty common. Okay, now here's a question I have. What if a person lives in, let's say, a, let's say it's a house, they're renting a house, and the family who's renting, the family who's on the lease, as someone subletting one of the back bedrooms, how much right? How much? How many rights or not rights does that person have? That person subletting. Um, are they renting a room or are they renting the house? They're renting a room in the house. Okay, so and if they're renting a room, are they sharing the same common spaces as yes. with? Okay, so they this person has roommates. Uh, not in their room, but there's a it's a house right with say a family right renting the house on the lease right and that family that's renting the house okay the family that's doing the renting leasing has decided to have someone le rent one of the rooms can help them out with their right finances right how many rights does that subleaser have? So, so under the state of California, okay, uh, in situations where it's a roommate situation, meaning when you share common spaces, like share the same bathroom right. or share the same room, the fair housing laws are not going to be applicable. Important to know. Okay. Because the interests, the privacy interests of the roommates are going to take precedent over fair housing. Okay, so the only way that person in that room could get rights is to be on the lease. To no, say, I want to be I, on the lease? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it would be on the lease. It, it, it has to be a separate unit, like an in-law unit or a guest house or okay. a cottage. Okay. It can't be a situation where you're sharing the same common spaces okay. as, as another okay. roommate. Yeah. Really? So that person doesn't have very many rights? No. Okay, that's good to know. It's good to know. All right, so we talked about common fair housing complaints, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, can you tell us what what is meant by reasonable accommodation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's the comedy portion of the show, folks. So that's something that we already discussed, but I can do a recap. Please do, because yeah. repeating for seniors is a good thing. Yeah, so oh. that's a request to make an exception, a housing pro provider to make an exception to a policy or a rule, such as making an exception to a no pet policy, so asking for an emotional support animal or a service animal. And I mentioned also maybe a, a unit transfer or something like that. Okay, all right, now, um, I want to try to find a way to go more in depth, but I don't. Uh, I don't want to belabor it so much that you guys wonder why we're belaboring it. So maybe we'll go closer to the end of the questions, and then we'll pick out some stuff in the middle somewhere okay. that we can go back over. Uh, 
what are some of the common requests for reasonable? We already did that. Mm -hmm. We already said that twice. Well, so I we can don't go want... into more detail about reasonable accommodation. Can you please? Yeah, that's Thank you. It's no problem. So you're making this request for an exception to the rule based on your disability. So you have to be disabled in order to um, request one, and then your request has to be related to that disability. So, so say, let me ask a question mm -hmm. about that. Do I need a note letter from my doctor that says this man has a learning disability, this man has an anxiety disorder, and therefore he needs X? Or how would that, how does that, how do I present that to so the owner? It really depends on the situation. So if your disability isn't uh, visible or readily apparent, right. then yes, then you might need a letter from a third party. A doctor, a doctor. is a great example. Okay. It doesn't have to be a doctor. It doesn't have to be. No. Well, who else could it be? So it depends on the disability. So it could be a therapist, it could be a okay. social worker. Some health professional. It's, yeah. Okay. A knowledgeable third party. Okay, okay. Um, what happens if a housing provider denies a tenant's request for a reasonable accommodation. What happens? You, you want yeah. to take it? Sure. Okay. Uh, sure. So if the housing provider has denied the request, he or she has to provide a reason to explain why they're denying the request. And would that be verbal or written or any either one or what? It, it could be verbal or written, but what's most important is why they're denying the request. Okay. Uh, it, it can't they can't just say we, you know, we're not we going to issue. You. We hate you. <laughs> no, you, you, they, they can't just say that and then just, you know, think this, the, the issue is going to go away. They have to demonstrate a compelling reason. And I think Janae touched upon some of those reasons. They, it, it, if it's an undue administrative or financial burden, okay. or if the request would fundamentally alter the nature of the housing provider's existing like operation, okay. if, it, if it would create a, a, a safety hazard or threat on the property, those could be the reasons as to why... Those are legitimate reasons from the point of view of the owner. Yes. Okay, yes. now, a question. Uh, in the past, a person I know was denied housing in the following way. I lived in a group home uh, there was 20 or 30 of us lived in this group home. The owners came along after we'd been there a year and a half and said, we're going to remodel the upper floor to make the fall some changes. Uh, therefore, everybody on the second floor needs to move. It sounds like they could do that. Is that right or wrong? Well, I mean, this is definitely getting more into landlord-tenant laws. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm assuming some kind of written notice would have to be presented. Okay. Um, where the fair housing laws come in, I guess it kind of depends. But I think that's something that would definitely be more of like a landlord-tenant type situation concerning okay. like remodeling. Yeah. Okay. Because in that case, everyone on the second floor moved. I went back a year later and uh, no changes had been made to the property and all those rooms had been re-rented. Mm. There was somebody okay. on that second floor they wanted out, so. Okay. Okay, so we have about five minutes left, roughly speaking. Uh, I only have a few little questions left. Let's do a review and wrap up, would that be okay? Sure. Okay, so, uh, Let's see, what are the most basic, most important things you want our audience to know? Okay, so if you or someone you know feels or suspects that they have been discriminated in housing, the most important thing is to contact Project Sentinel. And our phone number yes, is 408-720-9888. You can also access us online at www.housing.org. Housing.org. How you ever got that website, I'll never know. <laughs> and Janae, do you have anything you want to add to that? What are some of the, what's the one most important thing that you would like our audience to know? Definitely, I want to reiterate the importance of calling us as soon as possible. Sometimes we get calls a little bit later, say if you get a 60-day notice or something like that, it's important that you act on it as soon as possible. Okay, and geographically, or what city are you in? Because it's hard for seniors are usually using the bus, they're using Lyft, they're using paratransit. Uh, where are you located geographically? 
Uh, yes, so our main office in, is in Santa Clara City, but we do have branch offices in Sacramento, Redwood City, and Fremont. Um, and again, we serve Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, uh, Stanislaus County, um, Sacramento County, and also the city of Fremont within Alameda County. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask you another one of these questions. But give me a couple minutes at okay. the end there somehow. Okay. Cough or something. How are families with young children discriminated against? Okay, so families of young children are often <coughs> discriminated uh, by really strict occupancy policies. Uh, we'll see ads online that will say, for example, two bedroom, two people max. Who is that affected? is families of young children because they're often in households greater than two. Um, also, noise. We get a lot of noise complaints where... Oh, really? Yeah, where, you know, we have situations where tenants are almost kicked out of the property because the kids are making too much noise, even though the kids are just being kids and they're just, you know, maybe making some mild noise in the apartment, you know, between okay, four and six Okay, I, I need to ask you more about that. So I'm going to put this here temporarily. Uh, I have an example, three floors, mm -hmm. person on the first floor is upset with the people on the second floor or mm -hmm. thinks, thinks he or she is upset with the people on the second floor because they hear noise. Mm -hmm. Could be loud television, could be walking across the floor in your shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, a person on the first floor has left a lot of notes on the door of the people on the second floor. Mm -hmm. Are the people on the second floor really doing something that could cause them to be evicted or not? I mean, I think the answer is that it really depends. I think going back to families with young children, I think the key is that is that there's some things that kids do where you just have to kids be kids. So, for example, if a young baby is crying in the middle of the night, while that could be deemed to be a little annoying, it's a baby's going to be a baby, right? And so the, the parent should not be have their housing jeopardized because their baby just happens to be crying in the middle of the night. Now, if it's you know an 18-year-old person or someone in high school <laughs> making noise yeah. in the middle of the night, yeah. I think that's one Different thing. Different thing. Yeah. So I think it just depends on the context and on the situation. All right. And we may take this issue up on the next show as well. Okay. I want to start wrapping. Is that, yeah, I've got one minute here. So, ladies, bless you for the work you're doing. Thank you for being part of Project Sentinel. Uh, thank you for encouraging our guest, guests to come, our viewing guests to come and call you. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been In Our Community. Um, thank you so much for being here. Please tune in next time, folks. We'll talk to you soon.